that brings me to uh, the fact that we're now opening the, the, the discussion. Please uh, uh, post your questions. And here I have one question uh, by Stanislas Cozon. Let me read the question. The, the question is, I have read references to common good, public good, po possibly also common goods. Could you please elaborate on how you define these and how to avoid being naive about governance? Um, let me just say, uh, to me uh, here, um, you know, a, a public good is a, a collective good as opposed to a private good. And a global good is global as opposed to being national, just uh, to make it simple. Uh, and, and the common good is, is a, a good that we all need uh, to, to sustain and we all need to collectively sustain. And this is why we need it to be regulated. For example, access to clean water or non-polluted air. Uh, that is a common good for us. But if we do not collectively regulate that common good, it won't be a common good. It can turn into what us would, would call a, a, a global bad. But let me turn to you, As. Would you like to comment on the... Uh, last part of the question, which is how do you define, the, how do you avoid being naive about global governance? Well, so naivety, you know, is a subjective feeling. And um, so how do you avoid you know, to, to do that? Well, I, for me, I, I belong to the naive and I assume that because you have to be naive, you know, to be optimistic. You have to be naive you know, to not only think out of the box, but maybe get, get rid of the box altogether. You have to be naive, you know, to also engage, I think, in what seems to be impossible, you know, today, and then putting the action to shape, you know, the future, you know, that you want. So someone, I think that was back in 68, to say, well, there's no revolution without utopia. And I don't think, you know, we won't have, you know, the future we want if we don't have a certain doses, you know, of naivety. You know, the um, lack of that will just be to uh, accept, you know, the status quo, you know, to call it to be realistic and be realistic to what to meaning and to not taking any action, you know, to change or to do what we have to do today to have the future we want tomorrow. Thank you. Um... Switching gears somehow, uh, there's a question from Daniel Andler um, that crisscrosses with a number of points that were raised by several of the panelists. Uh, Daniel Andler, would you like to ask your question? Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it wasn't really a, a question. It was just emphasizing, especially what uh, Mr. Kamas was saying, how important it is to be able to um, nudge behaviors in the right direction and what we think is the right direction uh, without somehow committing uh, paternalism or other ethical uh, sins. And I was just pointing out that these topics, how do you, how do you make norms, new norms emerge? How do you make old norms which are toxic uh, vanish? or be subdued somehow, how do you create an atmosphere of trust on uh, social networks? All of this has become the focus of um, a scientific research program that isn't often mentioned. I mean, all of you are obviously aware and of uh, the importance of this topic but I don't hear very much, very often in such circles, uh, mention of cognitive science, social psychology, behavioral economics, that are all conducting extremely interesting empirical research and conceptual research on these topics. And for example, anti-vax, there's lots of excellent, excellent uh, insights on what um, on, 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 on the deeper reasons of this anti-vax movement that could profitably, I think, be exploited uh, by people such as yourself. So I just wanted to say that there's an ongoing research
program on these topics it doesn't cost very much and would be well worth investing in. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the panelists to uh, sort of comment on uh, Mr. Andler's uh, remarks? Uh, be it from a uh, vaccine uh, confidency perspective, maybe Antoine being from uh, referring to what Jean uh, Camarx uh, had said, uh, or, or other panelists. And may I bring in something I, I tried to bring in earlier in the conversation, which is it isn't that there are just, uh, you know, it isn't just about nudging behaviors into the right directions. It's, it's also about uh, fighting uh, the, in the structural inequities, the structural determinants that actually will shape uh, and, and, and the, 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 cap the capacity of an individual to, to change or not to change uh, behavior. Um, we've, we've been hearing uh, anecdotes here or there of people who, fearing to le lose their fragile work, would, would hide their COVID uh, infection rather than, um, you know, reporting and, and going to, 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 to contact tracing. Um, so when, when, when you have no choice, uh, not easy to change behavior. So um, comments. Who'd like to go, Jean, maybe? Okay. My point is about social networks and uh, behaviors. We, we have talked about Ebola. Um, Ebola, I would say nobody would have criticized the fact that Ebola was uh, a very dangerous disease. Uh, COVID, we discovered that you could have one million different opinions. Some people telling you, uh, COVID is not dangerous at all. It's a joke. It is a small flu. Uh, some others, of course, uh, uh, explaining that it is very dangerous for some people. And as Antoine uh, has shown on the slides, both are true. It is not dangerous for uh, rather young people, very dangerous for, for old people. One, one example. Social networks, we saw also um, doctors not trusting doctors, governments not trusting some doctors, and some doctors not trusting some governments. It is a huge mess. Uh, how can we expect uh, the general population to trust public messages when doctors do not trust the other doctors? Uh, it is a, a blunt way to say it, but this is what was very visible on the social networks when in the past it existed, but, but it was uh, hidden. And suddenly, distrust has become the new normal. I, I'm sorry to say that as bluntly as that, but any government efforts, any prevention efforts will not work if distrust is, is a new normal. And as we all know, uh, uh, people abiding by some rules, uh, uh, people doing uh, uh, some things and not doing other things will be key uh, in uh, avoiding massive economic impact of this disease. Whether it is pandemic, endemic, we will know. But if we want it to be manageable, we need trust. We need people to follow some rules. And I must say that uh, governmental bodies, international health bodies are very junior in managing social networks, in communicating on social networks. The first impressive thing that I saw was more than 10 years ago, the Center for Disease Control of Atlanta communicating on Twitter. Super smart super easy, super efficient. It took a few years for other governments to follow that trend. But we live in a new world and uh, public communication on Twitter, public communication on, on uh, Facebook, public communication on YouTube is, let's say, conflicting public communication by one million people who don't trust them. If we don't hack it, if we don't collectively uh, find ways to, to be efficient on the social networks, many things will not work. 
Uh, and, and this touches the point about data. Uh, data, I hope, will bring more confidence. And today there is not enough confidence in each little bit of data which is published. So this is maybe the way we can work together, data, social networks, building trust. This is my overall comment. Thank you. It certainly, uh, you know, echoes parts of, of the interventions of every single panelist today. So uh, may I call on the other panelists uh, for a brief comment around this issue of, of trust, which, which uh, you know, us also uh, mentioned as, as a key element of, of building uh, order. Uh, so maybe a, a few comments because of course the trust on vaccines is uh, yes thank is you all. for taking take please take a bit of this topic that was also a, a question uh from um, um i'm sorry anyway there, there was a question that i neglected to put to to, to the panel on this so please elaborate so yeah no the, of course the trust on vaccine is of course uh, high in the uh, in the uh, on the media today there's uh, an, an increased uh, feeling of uh, challenges on the uh, trust on the quality of the data in a way we have to remember that normally it takes 10 years for the vaccine so it takes 10 years Today we have sequenced uh, the, uh, the the virus, and we found the antigen, and actually found the way to manufacture this antigen in less than ten months. So, obviously, uh, the, the the question around safety and efficacy associated with these vaccines is: it's okay that people are wondering what are the the the, the facts behind the, the development of those vaccines, and that's why the health authorities are actually uh, digging into it. But I just want to say that vaccines, uh, 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 vaccines uh, 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 has always been in the center of, of polemics. Huh? And, but at the same time, we see that uh, year to date in the US, the numbers of vaccines have increased by 50% for the flu. Okay, so yes, you will always hear a lot about the, 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 the septic around the utilization of vaccines, but at the same time, you see that these type of crisis increase the willingness of actually getting access to, to vaccines. So to, to your point, the question Jean, is, okay, who is getting the voice in social media um, and who is representing the majority in terms of behavior? And as we know, uh, to, to, to actually uh, uh, take on the on the point of uh, uh, the intervention of someone uh, previously, we know that a, a negative news is twice more tweeted or retweeted than a positive news. It's just because they create the buzz. So that's the problem. And so on social media and on the network of influence that you will generate, you will see higher influence on the negative and lower influence on the positive. But we know, also know that there are ways to actually address those, those questions in, in bringing more or in sharing more positive news also uh, through, uh, through influencers. And influencers in this category, that is also something that we know, are not the classic key opinion leader that sits in a, a, a hospital university that knows the subject very well, but often a general practitioner that just happened to be followed by millions or hundreds of thousands of doctors and individuals that just get the point across. So we, we need to structure that better. That's this community of influence and ensure that what is also positive facts are also shared because it's incredible. Let's put it that way. I never thought, honestly, in March that we would have a vaccine ready in December. It takes 10 years. It's incredible. We just sequenced this, vac this virus in January. It's amazing what has been done. Thank you. Uh, Antoine, de Juliette, can I call on comments yeah. from you around this issue of vaccine and confidence? Yeah, maybe Juliette, you want to start? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Sorry, I, I got disconnected accidentally. Yeah, the the whole issue of misinformation around vaccines has um, been one of the most unfortunate uh, 
aspects of, I think, the whole COVID experience over the past nine months. Um, but I think that the reality had, had, there had been a building up of misinformation on prominent social networks such as Facebook, um, to a lesser extent, Twitter. I think Twitter was better controlled, but certainly Facebook was relatively uncontrolled. And I think that this, I think um, certain unscrupulous leaders, unfortunately, took advantage of this to promote um, a lot of the anti-vax um, messaging. Because when, um, I think uh, um, it was Alexander, I think, who mentioned that we, we know where it's coming from. The research is there. We know how this has evolved. Lack of trust has been an important issue, yes. However, it has collated, it has collided, if you will, with um, the, the whole sense of needing to be protected and needing to be governed because um, everything has become such a mess uh, on account of the fact of COVID-19 being this strange thing that has taken over the world. And people's belief in sound structures no longer, you know, holding them up any longer. Um, but I, I think there has to be some more regulatory activity um, on the, the major social media networks, because that's where a lot of this comes from. I can't tell you how many of my patients here in Ghana ask me about some of these ridiculous comments. Um, and I find that uh, I try to break it down, the scientific details down into a, a um, communicative style that they can understand what exactly is going on. And I find that that is usually enough because they're smart enough to put one plus one together and come up with two. Um, but it does show me that irrespective of their socioeconomic scale, because that we do see people at the top level all the way down, um, it's, it's really the social medias that have been driving this. And I, I, I really have been most disheartened by this particular aspect. Thank you. Antoine, can yes. I? Yeah. If, if I can say, I, I would think that we could use as an opportunity this anti-vax movement, surprisingly, because we need a vaccine for the at-risk groups, uh, for the whole world population. What we need to avoid is that uh, the richest countries uh, are vaccinated uh, at, the, uh, at the entire level. And if we can use the anti-vax movement to protect uh, the at-risk group and the elderly, we will have, uh, in fact, uh, secured the fact that the most important thing is to share the vaccine with the whole population. So if some people don't want it, let's not fight against that. We are very happy to uh, refrain more than 20, maybe 40% of uh, the uh, richest countries' populations to take vaccine. And I am rather confident that the elderly people, that those who would like to travel, because it will be probably mandatory to travel from a country to another country to be vaccinated, they will get the vaccine. And those who do want to uh, refrain to be vaccinated, probably we can let them uh, for the moment. It's not our priority. The priority is to protect the elderly, to protect the at-risk groups and, uh, and the healthcare workers. If they don't want it, and if they don't want to travel, if they don't want to be accepted in some settings, in some uh, uh, home care facilities and nursing home and so on, they, they will not. That's their responsibility. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, I'm now seeing it's 11.28 Geneva time. So uh, we are at the end of this uh, very interesting uh, session. I would like to warmly thank uh, the panelists uh, uh, for uh, a, an extraordinary wealth of uh, ideas, concepts, questions that, that were raised. Thank all those who asked the question and sort of triggered the discussion. We uh, touched on many topics, uh, data prevention, inf information, misinformation, uh, but let me just um, focus on three uh, on three things that I, I think came out of the discussion. One, 
uh, again, as an echo to what Tedros said on, on health is an investment, health is a strategic asset. The second, the fact that it is more and more unacceptable to the global citizenship uh, uh, the, to see uh, the chaos, uh, the lack of equity, the lack of inclusion in what um, uh, in what we do in responding to a pandemic. Uh, a lesson uh, learned from this pandemic is that we can't repeat the, the cacophony of the response of the first months where every country went on its own way uh, and, uh, and without uh, with with a sort of clear failure of of global regulation and governance, uh, and and the third point is of course from all of you uh, a, a call for uh, for some sort of regulation uh, in order to build. Um, uh, I'll be uh, again. I'll, I'll I'll call here a collective good that is public health. Um, that just as other uh, common and, and collective goods requires uh, regulation and governance, be it, of course, at national level, but also regional and global. And that is why, uh, Thierry, I, 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 I truly believe, and I'm sure all my fellow panelists believe that um, it is, it is a, a, a great initiative to move WPC also in, in this area. Of, of health and health governance. So thank you again to everyone and uh, back to you in, in Paris. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michel, and thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. I think it was a fascinating uh, session and a very good start. So uh, before switching to uh, session number two, uh, let me react very briefly on this question of public goods and uh, also uh, naiveness. Uh, first, an issue of common good, public goods, uh, global health as such, if you take global health as an entity, uh, yes, it is a public good or a collective good that can be discussed, but particular health uh, products, uh, medicine, I don't know, the, uh, the, uh, instruments, uh, uh, drugs are private goods. And there is a confusion used uh, very often, you know, between the, the, two, the two levels. But, you know, whatever the world is, uh, the concept is clear. The concept is global governance, because if you name global health a public good or a collective good, the issue is how to implement it concretely. And this is exactly what we are talking about. And uh, indeed, uh, Tedros, uh, Dr. Tedros is right when he speaks of investment uh, uh, versus uh, immediate consumption and so forth and so on. So that's my first point. But I cannot uh, but react on the, the question of being naive or not. Let me tell you that I am naive. I am very naive because uh, just uh, launching the WPC would have been impossible if I were not naive. Uh, and I am sure that Mr. SC is naive and I admire him for being naive. Now the question is that to succeed, that you have to have a long-term objective. You have to be an idealist a long-term objective, it has to be naive in that sense. But in order to have a chance to move from where you are to uh, the utopia, if you use the, the word, you have to be realistic in the short term. So there is no contradiction. One has to be naive in the long term and a realist in the short term. And if we agree on that, I think we are all, all of us, we are both naive and realistic. Uh, 